I'm the boss of me, right? It's, I define my own success. Yes, and that one had no um, facial expression, so I'm I'm very keen that you uh, have the cameras on for this one. Oh wow, you did it with no cameras. Yeah, just no cameras. I guess that's that's what he prefers. Maybe easier to edit, or who knows? On what platform? It was on Riverside, actually. So it was annoying because I just I downloaded the app for that and then just deleted it, and I had I redownloaded it for for this. So I. Maybe I'll just keep it on the phone now. Nice. And you're in Tokyo at the moment? I am, yes. Uh, I'm here for the week in between a uh, conference in Korea and a conference in Singapore. So it didn't make sense to fly back all the way to Barcelona. Amazing. Okay. And yeah, so you're based in Barcelona. But where, what you just moved, but was that just moving flats or something? Uh, no, that was actually moving to Barcelona. So I have been there since June and then, you know, Airbnb and then yeah, getting the permanent place. And I guess, yeah, very recent change for me. First time living out of the U.S., which is where I was born, uh, basically like full time. So it's a, it's a whole whole lot of travel. Great. OK, before we get into how you grew up, can you explain what you do in like oh you said it on that other podcast that you have a 30 second elevator pit elevator pitch but assuming you're not pitching to like a vc who actually knows what you're talking about like you're pitching to me who has like the a five-year-old level understanding of the blockchain uh yes so i so I like to think of the, the blockchain as basically um, an Excel spreadsheet that everyone can edit in the world. So imagine you've shared this with you know everyone in the world and everyone can edit it. And you basically have um, everyone edit it for you. So you can think of, say, a bank as a centralized Excel, spree, Excel, Excel spreadsheet where only the bank can edit it and you trust the bank to basically change your balances accordingly. The blockchain is edited by basically a bunch of people that through like complicated math and basically um, having money uh, on the on the line, edit it. And if they do something bad, then the money is taken away. So you, they're basically accountable to edit it for you, but you need to pay them in order to, to edit it. So a bank, it's pretty cheap. A blockchain to use it, it's it's a bit more expensive. And what I would just say our technology, it's an Excel spreadsheet but it's managed between basically me and you. If we were to send money to each other or do any sort of gaming activity, anything on the blockchain, we basically edit it between us. Blockchain is the whole world is editing it. Um, a bank is one person is editing it. And what our technology is called the virtual rollups is basically me and you or whoever the relevant people in the transaction are, those are the people editing it. So we call it local consensus. Cool. And you are the founder of this company? Yes. So Virtual Labs, been running it for nearly three years now under various names. And I'm the founder and sort of, I guess, behind the original idea with a lot of help of the cryptography along the way. Cool. Okay. So we will get to how you got to that point and dropping out of Yale and whatever along the way, which I feel like is just like a classic thing that you have to do to be a founder of a company. You have to do it. You have to do it. Okay. So where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Quincy, Massachusetts, a suburb outside of Boston. And I was born in Boston originally for a few years, but the rest of the 18 years of my life were, were all there. And what was your childhood like? Oh, uh, it was, I, it was good. I, I would say that it was probably not dissimilar from most other Americans' childhood. Uh, probably um, firmly middle class. I went to public high schools. I had 
friends um, went and did extracurriculars after school, soccer, swimming at, at various courses of the life, and had a, a mom and dad and no, no siblings. That's a bit different. And that's probably the, the high-level summary. Where are your parents from? My mom was born in Boston as well, and my dad is from uh, Medellin, Colombia. Cool. Have you been there? I have. I mean, yeah. probably not just... cool when he was growing up. Correct. Yeah, it's funny because the neighborhood where he was from was one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world, um, and now they made it into a tourist attraction. So it's a lot uh, different now. Um, and I've been I've been there. Um, basically the last three summers uh, in a row. I'm very close with uh, my abuelita there and my cousin and uh, my whole family. And I feel very, I, it gets me thinking about like genetics because I feel almost preconditioned to love like Colombian food and the weather there. There's, I think, something to be said about sort of nature versus nurture. And my mom is, for example, much more comfortable and, and my family on, on her side, very comfortable with like the cold weather. And I am so anti cold weather. Like it's one of the reasons I moved to Barcelona. My happiness is one part heat and one part sunny. And if I have like two of those things, that's that's most of my happiness secured. And so growing up in Boston, as you can imagine, would <laughs> therefore not be great for that. Uh, so when I, I go to Columbia, I feel like I just have like a very warm blooded and I love the food there. And I, I very I very much love it there. So I I feel very connected um, genetically to my roots. How did your dad end up moving to the U.S.? Oh, wow. He so actually my mom is a avid traveler. I got that from her and she went all the way from uh, basically in her car from Boston to Argentina. So the Pan American Highway and drove from, you know, all through the States, through Mexico, through Central America. She got to Panama, realized it's impossible to drive from Panama to Colombia because of the Darien Gap and sold her car there. This, by the way, over the course of years and with different friends and companions along the way and a lot of adventure stories I've heard throughout my childhood, sold her car in Panama and flew to Colombia, where she taught English and set up a bit of a life there and met my dad. And eventually they ran, ran off together and uh, went to Cuba and then to Spain and then eventually, with my mom, uh, moved back to, to Boston and, and I was born. Oh, my God. Amazing. Wait, so what was your mom's growing up like for her to go on that adventure? Um, she is uh, one of four, all, all daughters. Um, my, I'm, I'm very close also with my, my grandfather and, and my grandmother. Um, and he, I think he, um, uh, meaning my, my grandfather, her, my mom's father was very hard on the family. I think he, you know, he's just sort of a macho guy. He was like, he's an amazing story. One of seven kids, um, his mom, uh, ran away when, um, when she was, when he was young and he, was the youngest of, of, of yeah of seven. Um, his dad was alcoholic and abusive, and he put himself into the Marine Corps, um, where he used the GI Bill to eventually uh, go to law school, uh, but not before he was uh, an amateur boxer, where he won the Golden Glove and was also a police officer, and then put himself through law school and now owns his own law firm. So he is an amazing story that, yeah, it's just sort of a role model for me. But you can imagine that type of person was yeah, pretty hard on his four girls growing up. So that was a bit of her context. And she grew up in Boston? She grew up, uh, yeah, outside of Boston. And when did her family come to the U.S.? Do you know that history? 
Oh, uh, I think they've been here for generations. Um, I mean, they're, I think we're sort of Scots Irish or something on that side of the family, but, um, as, as far back as, as we know, we've, we've been here maybe, maybe six or seven generations or so. Cool. Nice. Okay. And your dad's fat. Do you know about his? Sorry, I'm just really into asking people's ancestry lately. And because lots of people do these yeah. DNA tests and they have fun stories. But do you know when his yes. family came to Colombia? Came to Colombia. That or I don't how... know. I, I know less on my dad's side of the family. Um, I know my abuelita. Um, my grandfather, my father's father, was um, murdered when he was very young. Uh, cartel uh, violence, and I don't know beyond that. But I imagine they've also been in in Colombia for for some time. Mhm. Interesting. Okay. So, as an only child, and then with like family in Colombia, were you close with your cousins and stuff in Boston? Yes, uh, I was pretty close. They were, I've now, so out of the, the four um, the daughters on my, on my mom's side, um, one, of them, one of them was in Florida for a lot of my childhood. The other was in Texas and all the associated cousins, of course, there as well. And, um, and then one in, um, in the Boston area. So I was very close with him. But yeah, for a lot, a lot of my yeah, early childhood, they were either in, a lot of them were in Florida or Texas. So I was close to them, but not in proximity. And you had a mostly happy childhood? It's, a, uh, it's hard to put a few words to maybe 18 years of, uh, of existence, but yeah, I, I would say that a lot of, a lot of ups and downs, uh, a lot of pressure, uh, like, like my mom, maybe, um, specifically from my dad. So on, on being the best that I can be and, and being the best overall. And so specifically in high school, um, to, you know, be at the top of my class and, and go to the best university and, and sort of do it all. And so there was a lot of pressure, uh, that was not always positive, but if I were to, to summarize in a few words, it would, it would be not much that I regret. Where do you think that pressure came from? Like, why was your dad like that? I would say he's a very, very high IQ um, individual. Um, very much also sort of on the like autistic spectrum. And people like that are almost have an inability to sort of get things done. So you overthink everything sort of, you know, you've heard of like, um, ignorance is bliss. Um, very much. I think there is a correlation there and, uh, he wasn't able to, I guess, get everything done that he wanted to in part because of those inhibitions that I think he just overthinks everything. And so he wanted me to be that success, but also I have to give a credit to, you know, he grew up in a much more difficult times. So that's also a very big part of it as well. So I have a lot of opportunities that he didn't have. And so the pressure in my eyes was to achieve what he didn't. Got it. And were you aware that that's kind of where it was coming from, that he was like projecting onto you? Not at the time and not until recently. Mm-hmm. What did both your parents do? My dad he experimented with trading and uh, being a handyman. He was also in charge of our uh, house, which we rented out, and that was a, a source of income. And uh, my mom loved uh, travel, especially, so um, like a sales um, agent and uh, also worked odd jobs doing um like at law firms, at um, other source of, of, of sales. Um, very happily, as of uh, a month ago, she's back in travel after the pandemic. Um, so that's very uh, exciting to, to see for her because that's what she just loves doing. I've never seen her happier than when she's just selling trips. And that's uh, that's been, yeah, um, a large part of, of her work. But yeah, it's been um, a lot of different exciting jobs for her. 
Great. And what were their values? I don't know. I values in, in in what sense do you think? Like, so I guess you had your dad was putting that pressure on you, but was there anything from your mum? Like, did you have a sense of what your mum wanted for you? I think just what any mom wants for their child to be happy, and I think she she did a good job at that. I think to a lot of the focus in my head is is on my my father's pressure, but she also um, wanted a lot from me. Um, I think she was probably maybe the driving force between a lot of. She put me in a lot as a kid in a lot of like acting schools and stuff. She really wanted me to 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 do something like that but that's not how my brain works and so she put me in a lot of things yeah like uh drama um acting singing i think even uh, oh i experimented with music as a lot of kids do it wasn't my thing um and um and in terms of values it's hard to say i mean values I would say that maybe sort of excellence, um, privacy is a, is a big one, sort of um, being humble and just um, and doing well and, and, and doing well without maybe announcing it everywhere um, and, and doing well for others. Um, specifically within the family um so that's been uh now that i'm am i'll say somewhat successful and and looking forward to to taking care of them and that's uh i think the sign that was instilled and in, uh, in me from an early age nice did religion play a role in your upbringing at all not really i both of them are i think Catholic by denomination, um, you know, Irish Catholic and Colombian Catholic, and neither of them go to church. Um, I, I think maybe the values, you know, come from there a little bit. So sort of the stuff I mentioned about family and, and doing good unto others and and humility, but never went to church, um, and that wasn't such such a big part. Okay, so did you? live up to your dad's expectations through school that's a good question ask him i i don't know i think i think i don't care i think that i, I lived it to my own expectations and and that's all that matters by numerically no he wanted me to be valedictorian and i was salutatorian so you what know, just off mean? the cuff uh, it means uh, second. So basically, the salutatorian is the person who who announce uh, opens the graduation, and the valedictorian is the one who does the farewells. Uh, so I was number two. My best friend was number one, and he wanted me to be number one. But I mean, I got into my top choice university, and they have gotten yeah pretty much everything uh, that I could hope for. So that's what matters. And I think now I hope that uh i've met those expectations but yeah again it's i'm the boss of me right it's i define my own success yeah and it's something it's like something outside of him like it's something within him that he's like seeking something external like it can never be filled like as in it goes with anything it's like putting something like that onto someone else it's just not even to do with you it's to do with him yeah, I think that's right. I, I, and I, that's something that I maybe I wished that either of us had realized earlier. And I wonder also if it's the full picture because it's my speculation that I think is probably right. But I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not certain if if it's all um, all external wishes that he wanted to achieve. But do you think you would have been that driven academically if it wasn't for that? 
this is something that my mom talks to me a lot about because in high school, I really pushed him away. Um, I actually went to live with my aunt for a little while and I yeah lived on, lived on my own and, and sort of wanted to chart a bit more of my own story. And during that time is actually when I excelled the best in school. It's hard to know. It's hard to measure that in a vacuum because at that point was my success. Was it as a result of him, in spite of him, irrelevant of him? I'm not sure. I think I'm a big in the nature versus nurture debate. Um, sort of what I, I touched on earlier. I'm very big into nature. And so I, I think that I would have been regardless because that's the type of person he is. So because of him, but not because of his pressure, because of the blood that flows through my veins, I think I would have been that way regardless. But it's, it's interesting to note because in middle school and even early high school, I was, I was not the, I, I, I definitely lacked ambition. I was very into video games. I never did my homework. I was on track to live a disappointing life, according to my father. And interestingly, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure there. Like, at least to my memory, I don't remember. I remember my mom scrutinizing that more than, than my father. But in really, like, sophomore year of high school is where I really started turning up the heat. Uh, and then it was junior year where I, I sort of went out of my own um, my own journey. So... It's hard to know what really clicked in me because I actually don't know like what changed between freshman and sophomore year and and then into the rest of high school that I really um, I, I I remember going from like not caring, not doing homework at all to like checking like my school rankings and my GPA like once a week and 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 just grinding and that that was my whole life at that point. It was to the point where in senior year, um, fall of of senior year, I was. I was on like drugs just so I could stay awake for 22 hours a day um, and do my college essays. And I was doing um, I was doing nine AP classes and which was four more than my school allowed. So I had to um, I had to invent some and, and, and I had to basically ask them to take the class and have them invented for me. And. And then I was also in a, a bunch of extracurriculars as well. So that was like really crazy. And that's not something that freshman Jose would have imagined, but that was all, all self-inflicted. Wow. You taking Adderall? Uh, Adrafinil, yeah. And you don't know why you made that change? It wasn't like a flick because I worked very hard in junior year as well. But I don't know what initially set it off. I, I had to guess maybe it would be, I guess, just that. I, I've always, I think very, I think a lot of us sort of like this, the, the rat race, basically meaning that in, in middle school, for example, we like took all these, um, actually no, it was in elementary school, we took these placement tests if there would be like um, a special program for us to go to in middle school. And then after that, we then have a GPA in high school where we have to do all these and we have to work hard. And then we do all of this for the service of taking another placement test, the SAT to get into college. And then after that, there's your you know GEDs and you do all these grinding to then get an internship placement. And then after that, you're doing the same thing to get vice president or senior leadership role at whatever company you're working for it basically it never ends there's always another thing to work for in sort of three to four year cycles for the next promotion or the next placement and i think maybe one of the things i'm i'm pretty good at is measuring risk and like measuring what's a high ev activity so in middle school i didn't care so much I cared a little bit. I was just okay in middle school. Um, but in high school, I'm like, okay, this actually matters. This part really matters because your university placement is, is really relevant. So I didn't care in middle school so much. And then I really worked hard when it mattered. And then after I got into Yale, I didn't care at all because I knew I wasn't going to grad school and I didn't, 
I probably wasn't going to do anything that required a good GPA. So I, not a good GPA, but, but by the time I dropped out, it wasn't why I dropped out. It was, um, it wasn't that bad, but it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, anything that was going to win me, um, summa cum laude. And so I, I would say that maybe it was a wake up call of recognizing that high school, if any time in my life would be, it was the time to, to go all in. Got it. Okay. And at that point it was just like, I want to win this game to get the good result or whatever, to get into a good university because I want to get into a good university. Yes, I think so. And did you have any idea of like what you would do with your life beyond that? I wanted to be a programmer. Uh, so I actually entered a lot of, uh, like competitions and stuff and I did pretty well. Um, did some like science fair stuff. We went all the way to States then the pandemic hit and that was sort of what my track was. And then I got to, to uni and then realized it wasn't for me, but that's another story. Uh, so that was, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to design cool things and allow my creativity to flow because I, I consider myself. Yeah. I'll say art artistic creative and programming is a very like logical way to, to do that. And so I was like team captain of robotics. So I loved like working with hardware, but mostly on the software side because it was something I could do myself because I am a very, as any person in my, my team will tell you, I'm a very impatient person. And so I love just being able to program myself and I'm only waiting on myself. Um, hardware requires to order components and, and solder things. And you don't have the right machine at the moment and you have to wait for other people. So I, I learned I didn't like hardware and it was a great way to build something myself. Okay. But the idea is you would go to a good uni because what? Because it's an unanswerable question. Why, why does everyone want to go to a good uni? Oh, well to, to get a good job. All this. But like, why really? Like, I don't know. It just, it's just the next thing to do when you don't have life figured out. It's, it's what people tell you to do. It's, it's probably not the worst mistake you can make. Yeah. Okay. No, but there could be a thing of like, okay. Like the person I interviewed this morning, he wanted to play football. So it was like, he wanted to go to a football school, but then he's like, Oh mm. shit, to get a good job. Now I just have this football school. So I need to get into like a more reputable thing because I want, to be taken more seriously or whatever or like mm -hmm. people care about prestige or like people are like oh i prefer smaller schools because it's going to ivy leagues is more like bullshit because this or whatever but did you like what kind of thinking did you have around it i i guess a lot of it was sort of self in, hmm, uh self-imposed and also you know, um, paternally imposed. So it was just installed like, Oh, you, like, what do you do? You go to a good university. Why do you do it? Cause it's what you do. Why, what do you do? You go to a good university. Like it was almost a, like a, an infinite loop. And so I, I have a very distinct memory at the very first week of uh, my engineering class with my, one of my favorite teachers, Mr. Tully, he was the best. He, um, my, my, one of my, one of my best friends, he put Yale on his, um, on his like list of schools he wanted to go to. And I remember very distinctly making fun of him. I was like, why would you go to, to Yale? Like, this is, this is where they wear elbow patches and they're, you know, tweed and they're old guys doing, um, you know, writing on chalkboard. I don't know. That was just the memory I had. And this, by the way, this is senior year. So this is like two months before I ended up applying. So I clearly, did not have a very good concept of, of the school at the time or really any school. Uh, I was in Boston. So MIT and Harvard were always on the radar, but I was very against them because they were so close. I wanted to get away from Boston both because it's cold and because it's something, something old, right? I wanted to do something new. And, and so then you say like prestige, I don't know. I, 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 it was just sort of what I wanted to do. And when I ended up applying to Yale because there are, I basically set my sights on Stanford and I got a very bad um, math two score 
which is one of the SATs you need to take. And so I'm like, ah, crap, now I can't apply to Stanford for early admission. So I'm like, okay, what are other early admission schools I can apply to? And there are only five in the U.S. That basically mean if you get into it, you don't need to go. Because a lot of them in the U.S., if you get in, you have to go, which I think is a, a very dumb rule. I think that should be illegal. That, that that should be like an antitrust lawsuit waiting to happen. That if you get in, you have to go. A 17 or 18-year-old kid, that, that, I, that, I think that's silly. I, I, I don't like that at all. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, there are only five um, like top-tier schools that do not have this rule. Uh, it's Harvard, MIT, Yale, Princeton, and Stanford. Harvard and MIT, I didn't want to go to because I was really close. Stanford was the one that I wanted to wait until regular admission, do another math level to get do better. But I'm like, okay, let me apply to one of the other regular admission uh, schools. Uh, so if I get in, then I can only apply to Stanford. Otherwise, if I don't get in, then I have to go to Stanford and all of them. And I flipped a coin between Yale and Princeton, got in, uh, applied, uh, got Yale, applied, and, and then got in and just never applied anywhere else. Um, so that, I, that that story is basically me saying there wasn't a grand plan. It was definitionally happenstance. And no, I think that's a lot. Narrowed down a lot. Uh, yeah. Well, let me let me flip the script if I could. You went to Cambridge for undergrad, right? No, for masters. For masters. What led you to your decision for undergrad, or, or for that for that matter, why why do you want to go to Cambridge for for your masters? It's obviously maybe the best school there is, but was it because of prestige? Was it because it was, they had the program? It, so that's because I like had a mental breakdown <laughs> and needed okay. a visa, but I was like, what? I would love to study at Cambridge. Yeah, because I love old stuff. Yeah, the pres prestige. But more, but it's not like, because banking for me was like a prestige thing with no authentic. I mean, there is some because it's like I like doing hard things and solving problems and working with smart people. But it was also like if I do this, everyone will think I'm really smart. Like how do I prove I'm really mm -hmm. smart? And because I'd moved from New York where everyone cares about banking, like that's the measure for that particular mm -hmm. city. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do this to like wear it as a badge. And then that fell apart. And then I went to, but yeah, the prestige thing with the Cambridge is like I'm obsessed with old stuff and like, like I ranked the colleges in order of like how old they were and like how traditional they were. It's like I want to go to the oldest, most traditional, which is kind of like a weird thing. Like it's not like that's a cool thing that's like a little quirk I have so and yeah same with I don't know like I like cold places so like going on exchange to the US it was like what schools are offered that you can go to for free and then it was like oh Ivy League cool like I didn't even know anything about this stuff but I was like okay I want to go somewhere cold I don't want to go like what are the best schools like UC Berkeley was on there and whatever but I'm like no I don't want to go to California because I like cold stuff <laughs> so it's gonna be northeast which is also Opposite like me old... yeah but yeah prestige but yeah prestige and then i've like but then it's interesting to work through that of like is it just ego or is it like no it's a genuinely like authentic thing that i like the tradition of whatever x y and z i don't know yeah yeah, it, it's it is weird. It's but it's it's interesting. Um, to, to I mean, rank them by the age. I, I think I find that super interesting. And what I what I find really interesting about the past, like why why I I spent two minutes or however long I spent on that anecdote about what I thought about Yale was because it's a very concrete memory that I can point to how I felt about the past because. I think humans are very, very bad at remembering the past how it actually was. And so we have to use objective measures. Not that memories are purely objective, but in the absence of written notes and pictures and other things like that, it's good to like ground yourself with very concrete experiences to let you know how you thought. And so now I would say that 
yeah, it's for signaling and legacy and all of these things. What, why I went, um, why I wanted to go to a good school, but I don't think that was the case then. And so it's, it's hard, to, it's hard to ascertain. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And okay. And then, so what, wait, so otherwise in school, did you, you like had good friends, enjoyed it? In high school, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, in high school, I was, yeah, I, I had, a, I had a, I think, a quite a, a good time, probably model, um, as in, like, what, like, I don't know, I, I, I was gonna, I was gonna say, like, what they would say in the movies, but maybe not, maybe just, like, what, what I would imagine, like, a perfect high school to be, I would say it was probably that, and I, I had a smaller group of friends, but I always remember doing like very fun things for my birthday. Um, like had a girlfriend, like traveled, went and man somehow and somehow managed to do this all while um grinding very hard. Uh, I even I even had like um like a, a friend of me in, in the form of the valedictorian who was like my friend and we did projects together and we all also we've known each other since we were five. I uh, played like soccer together as well, did swimming um, where I had another friend group. Um, and it was also, oh my God, it was also a brand new school. I got so lucky because in middle school, uh, it, it was a central middle school. And the first year, or actually the first three, four months, I think, it was in this really old decrepit building. And then we moved in the middle of the school day to this new building they had been you know, working on for five years. And then we got to be the first class to graduate from the new building, or I guess, no, the first one to, you know, have most of our time in the new building. And, and then we also went to, to Quincy high where it was also like a brand new building. And, um, that made it was like pretty impactful because great facilities. Um, I also had like a really good structure where I was like, I had like free periods where, and we had gym and, and all these things. And then right as I finished like doing all this grind, the pandemic hits. And then unfortunately we graduate hardly in a pandemic. So that, that sucked, but it was like the perfect time where it didn't impact my college uh, applications. And then when I would have just been chilling and doing nothing at school anyway, I was just doing that from home, which is worse, but it, it was much worse for other people. Hmm. Ha. Huh. Okay. So, and then did you go to Yale that year in 2020 when it was during the pandemic? Yes. And that sucked. So college off, off to a horrible start because they only let us stay on campus until Thanksgiving. And then they kicked us off technically for the next nine months. So they basically said, you get one semester on and then one semester off. And that was the case for like two years. So that, that, that sucked. <laughs> but high school is great. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. That is like, cause so much of that U S experience is like going and you pay all these fees, but it's like this whole thing. You're there for four years. It's like this other world. I don't know. Cause it's just like different in like where I'm from. It's like, you just, everyone lives at home still with their parents and you just like drive to class for one hour mm. a week. It's not like this special thing, but then it's also like not, you're not paying $200,000 or however much you're paying. Yeah. Well, I actually had a full ride. So good for me. <laughs> um, but <laughs> in the sense that I didn't have to pay that, um, and I do feel, yeah, bad for the kids that did have to pay that um, and got not the best experience. Damn. But I guess that four years, four year degrees. So you would have had at least, everyone would have had at least two years of normal. Yeah. And then, of course, by the end, the last two years, there was no pandemic. So they stopped it by, by that point. But it was, it was our first year. So it was our freshman year when we're all these traditions uh, like 
Camp Yale, um, Bulldog Days, like all these, you know, random traditions. None of them we got. Um, and it's sort of your introduction to college. And also as a only child who only went to public schools, it was my first sort of fraternal experience and also my first boarding experience. And yeah, it was not great. I, again, also got lucky because I actually got to stay on campus the full time along with international students. So basically they, they in invented a class. Um, it was the only in-person class for like a year and a half for the sole purpose of allowing international students to stay in the country because they were banned if there was no in-person classes, like their visas were revoked. So they invented one class just to, for visa exceptions. And um, we got to use that class, uh, international students and also uh, people that were on like full rides and like had like housing exceptions because my whole point again was to get away from, from Boston. So I was actually one of the lucky few that got to, to stay on. Um, but even still, then there was like very few people left, right? Cause I'm only there with international students and, um, much better than, um, the, the less fortunate kids, but still this was the, the craziness of, of my first two years, really my only two years, because then I dropped out. So I really never got a college experience. Huh? So what were you doing during that time? Um, I was mostly just living. Uh, I was never in class uh, and I was just doing eclectic things, going on hikes. Um, I, I, did, I did like random trips to New York at two in the morning. Um, I was hosting parties um, and yeah, stuff like that. Just, just, just being, just being a, a college kid. And what were the classes you were meant to be taking? Um, what was I doing? Uh, I remember distinctly in my math 115 final, which was taken from home because all the finals were after Thanksgiving and then they sent us home. Um, I had a, like a, I think, uh, a call options that just came into the money that I had previously written off. So context for non-financial viewers, basically I was trading, uh, stocks and I, didn't end up finishing my final because at that moment at like 9 30 trading happened and like they just reported earnings or something and there was a lot of volatility so i ended up just not doing it and just traded so that was the level of importance i had towards my classes uh so math i had some computer science classes i had some economics classes and i guess that's when i really got more interested in economics those are the only classes i actually did attend so i took a lot of classes under like Nobel laureates and um like experts in stable coins, which is relevant to my expertise now in, in, in blockchain. And that, yeah, that's, that's what I remember. Uh, I did have some really good seminars that I, are very memorable. Um, so if we basically get something called a first year seminar, which is like a 10 to 15 person class. And I had two of those and they're both like super great professors and those are really memorable, but I couldn't, I could not for the life of me, force myself to pay attention in, in the lectures with things that I already knew, um, like the super basic calculus and economic theory and, and all this stuff. So that I, I, I could motivate myself to do, but the, the, the seminars were great. And at what point did you start trading? I was trading in 2019. Uh, actually, well, yeah, I was trading full time yeah i guess end of 2019 after college applications and then obviously a lot under covid when it became popular but i was investing in forex um since 2018 and it was forex um options and then crypto that's actually my trajectory and how i got into crypto and what was that driven by i guess my father had done it so i knew there was a lot of money to be made there and there was again in my blood maybe the tolerance for risk that is sometimes good sometimes bad and was the attitude like okay i want to figure out how this works and money's the scoreboard kind of thing versus mm. like something to do with motivation to make money for some purpose i think it I think at this point it was motivation to make money. I don't think it was really about winning as 
you you clearly have rubbed shoulders with a lot of finance people because that was as basically the two camps people fall into. Um, but I think for me, it was more about the money. And what did you want money for? Take care of my family. Uh, it's been like the running joke that I have to buy my grandma a Tesla. Uh, and once I do that, then that's I've made it in, in some amount. So that's the that's the goal. Huh. Because it's like, oh, you have this talent, so you need to monetize it? Mm, no. So I guess remember when I was talking earlier about the like the family values and and one of those things that I guess was instilled in me for a while is, I guess, sort of looking out for your own. And my grandma also is a very interesting story. Um, she grew up also very, very poor. Um, and now, yeah, my grandfather has you know the law firm, so she's kind of a bit, um, a bit um, more of the taste for 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 finer things, um, but still there's a lot of need um in my family that I want to take care of and that's that's sort of step one. Once I can do that, then I can I can focus on myself. Uh but that's that's the first thing. Huh. Okay. And so at like seventeen or whatever you were like, I might as well get started on this. Again, it's hard to imagine what the the past was like what I was thinking because you can sort of rewrite the past if you're not too careful, but I I think so. Um, I mean, which what seventeen year old kid who has basically no expectations on him doesn't want to make it super big and then be able to take care? I mean, what a what a flex is that, right? When the expectations are so low for you, there is no it, it's almost inconceivable. Like having someone with so little means to do anything over 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 exceed expectations huh yeah but a lot of people don't i don't know a lot of people don't necessarily have that attitude it's kind of like every, every man for themselves or something or like i don't know or yeah if you grew up and your parents did do well then it's almost like the opposite like people like oh my god how will i ever be able to achieve the same standard of life that my parents gave me and then it can be kind of like people just need to like quit everything and just go backpacking for five years because it's like too much pressure but yeah. it's kind of like they've invented the pressure Yeah, it's maybe it's like it's like a catalyst. I, I the pressure comes from somewhere, and then and then it and then you create the pressure yourselves. And at some point, the initial source of pressure is gone, like it was for me and, and my father. Um, but then nothing changes, which is kind of interesting to observe. So, oh, like the original source is gone, and yet the same thing is happening. Mm. Okay, and then. So did you do well trading? Yes and no. Uh, I I did better with the long-term investments than with trading, as I think most people do. Um, crypto I did well with, which is the genesis of, yeah, my blockchain stuff. Options, less so, less good. Uh, I definitely blew up a few accounts trading options. Um, but Forex, also very, very profitable. But that was more um, investing than trading. Uh huh. Blew up in like what was your worst loss in a day or something? Um, a lot. Um, probably like six figures. Nice. This yeah. is the same as the guy I was right. interviewing this morning. This is so weird. He lost 150 in one day. I have to watch that one. Trading, uh, trading what? Um, it was SPAC. He made a lot on SPACs and then it was mm -hmm. something when it changed in that time yes. and then he lost a lot. Ah, yes. That's, um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a relatable story. <laughs> I made also a lot on specs and lost it. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so so then, what was the decision to leave Yale about? Okay, so this is the virtual labs era, or as it was called, entropy then. Um, me and, um, yeah, two of my best friends, we, I just had, I guess, had an itch to do something. They, um, had started a company and I ended up joining and the initial product was verifiable randomness for the purpose of selling it to casinos and, um, basically creating edgeless, um, games for basically eliminating advantage play. And... It transformed into creating decentralized data for price feeds. So basically, if you're trading crypto on chain, basically meaning like on, on this global Excel spreadsheet, who keeps track of, of the transactions, the movements? Well, the whole blockchain does, right? But who keeps track of the prices? Surprisingly, you may be interested to learn that it isn't the global same global blockchain that keeps the prices because that is too expensive because where does the price come from? The price comes from centralized exchanges like Binance and Coinbase. So the global blockchain can't monitor that. You need a centralized API to do that. It's just not, it's not intrinsically built into blockchain that the price of assets like Ethereum against USD or Bitcoin against USD is intrinsically in the blockchain. And we basically, and so the solution is basically sort of a centralized solution where you have this global blockchain that is on an Excel spreadsheet that anyone can access and therefore it's safe, right? No one can take your money away from you. It's censorship resistant. And you know, more importantly, you can always access it on and, and trade it on weekends and 4 a.m. and whenever you want. There's no restrictions to any of, any of that, which is the real appeal of blockchain, not a lot of the other things you see um, on the internet, uh, <coughs> NFTs. But the price feeds are centralized. It's completely given by an oracle, which is basically a person or technically a group of people, but the decentralization of that is under question. And they put the price on there, and then everyone just uses that price. But if that price were to get manipulated, then everyone's trades would be manipulated and settle at a wrong price. And that ha has happened to the tune of billions of dollars over the past few years. So we basically had a way to have users. Again, me and you are the ones coming up with the data ourselves, whether it's a verifiably random number, which was the initial idea in 2022, I guess. Yeah, late 2022. And then 2023, um, it was, yeah, yeah, um, was then more focused on uh, price feeds between me and you verifying data. And then now it's between me and you verifying transactions. So the entirety of the transaction, including the price feed, including the actual settlement, occurs just on this local consensus between an Excel spreadsheet managed between just me and you, not this global blockchain that is um, expensive to operate, very slow. And uh, it's a lot faster to just do it between ourselves and it's also more secure. And that's the progression of ideas. Can you give me an example of that? Of uh, which one? Of us doing a transaction. Yes. So best would probably be to explain it in the context of VDEX, um, which is our exchange we're launching in a few weeks. Essentially, if you want to use an exchange on, on, uh, on blockchain now, you have two options, basically. You can use Binance or Coinbase. And it's centralized, but as you saw with FTX, it is it, it is completely flies in the face of the ideals of crypto. It is not decentralized. It is not uh, there's no proof of liquidity. Uh, it, it, people, there's no um, transparency. So FTX was trading against their own customers and giving them worse price action, sort of you know payment for order flow. So there's that option, and then the other option is Uniswap or sort of these decentralized exchanges, or DEX. And DEXs have a few of their own flaws. The first is that they're just very expensive. To access that global spreadsheet, 
you need to pay them because for someone to change it for you, you need to pay them. And that can be anywhere from a few cents to a few dollars. And when everyone wants to trade, the network is very congested, it can cost hundreds of dollars, very expensive. It's also very slow. Uh, settlement takes between seconds and minutes, not a good trading experience, very far from high frequency or anything like that. And um, it's a few other problems, but those are the two biggest ones. And we created something that's in between because if you use an Excel spreadsheet with one person, they'll manipulate it and you get FTX. If you use it with everyone, it's too slow and it's too expensive. If we do it between me and you, pretend I'm the exchange, I'm basically VDEX, and then you want to trade. Well, it's between me and you. Technically, I am actually an exchange, uh, but it's not like a centralized exchange because you maintain these signatures and these proofs on your own device. So you're able to verify the liquidity. You're able to, if anything, Oh, I got a little icon. Um, if um, if we go down or if we start acting maliciously, then you're able to take your signatures and go directly to the underlying global spreadsheet and access those funds. So the, the user flow is as follows. You, you deposit escrow into the global consensus mechanism. So that does take some time and it is uh, expensive, but it only happens once. You just need to deposit your escrow. So use the global escrow, the global global blockchain as a source of escrow. And then the trading occurs in this, uh, we call it a virtual roll-up between me and you. And those transactions are then rolled up and then they go on the blockchain. But when we actually do all the trades, those can bypass a centralized entity and they can bypass the expensive and slow blockchain entity. And so you have something that is very, very fast, no fees at all, except the price of your own electricity to send the data. Uh, which is, again, basically rounded down to zero. And it's fully self-custodial because if we go down or if we become malicious or anything happens, you maintain the signatures on your own device. And that's the level of self-custody that we should bring to anything financial, in my opinion. So what's the business model? Like how do you make money? Yeah, so that is the underlying tech. You can build any sort of and that's the virtual roll-up uh, tech, you can build any sort of product on top of this. So the first business model is VDEX, uh, is an exchange. So while there aren't um, fees to use the network, there are fees to access liquidity. So we take a spread. We're the market maker. Um, we take a spread. Um, we're also basically able to earn uh, interest off of the funds that are in escrow, and we charge taker and maker fees. What we can also do is this technology we've invented, we have the rights to it and we can sell it to other people. And so our goal is not to build an exchange uh, in the long term. It's to prove that our exchange is better than anyone else's and eventually sell it to decentralized exchanges and maybe even centralized exchanges. Because why would you ever use Coinbase or Binance when you can use something that is the same level of user experience, just as fast, just as cheap, but more secure? Well, uh, hopefully that would have some customers and we want to be B2B in that sense. Cool. Okay. And so what are the transact? I literally know nothing about crypto. So is a transaction like me buying Bitcoin or something? Exactly. So any, any, any time you're on, um, basically any order you have, you know, you buy, um, 30 shares of NVIDIA, the equivalent on blockchain buying, you know, 0.3 Bitcoin or what have you, that's a transaction. And our goal is to basically make those transactions super quick um, and super cheap as they are on any stock exchange or as they are on centralized crypto exchanges like Coinbase and Binance. Got it. And what's the escrow? Uh, sorry, could you um, repeat that? Did it cut out? What is the yes. escrow? Yes, the escrow is basically the user depositing. So if you want to fund, say, a TD Ameritrade account, you have to wire some funds into this account. It's in then TD Ameritrade's account, and then you have that amount of balance to trade. In uh, Coin Coinbase or Binance, it's the same thing. You have to wire to their account. In decentralized exchanges, you have money existing on the blockchain. And so think of it like, uh, you have your own account. It's not a bank account. It's like a wallet. Uh, maybe you've heard of like MetaMask. 
and you have money in that, and then you send that, those funds to a smart contract. This smart contract is completely publicly audited and publicly accessible, so people can see that when they, when they put their funds in there, they are locked, so it becomes escrow. And obviously, we need to lock the funds so that we can allow users to trade and so they can't then withdraw it, but the rules of the smart contract are transparent. So um, a user is able to see, okay, I deposit, and I'm able to withdraw no matter what. The liquidity is there. All the liquidity is public. Also, the escrow is completely public, so there's no FTX-style situation where where the money go? Like they were inventing money on paper that was never actually in the accounts. Proof of liquidity is solved, and the user has a guarantee that all, if they call this function on this global computer, they can withdraw their funds. And with those two guarantees, you you basically have created a a censorship resistant and trustless exchange. But you're able to have it as fast and as cheap as something that is as it, that's something that is centralized. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's like USD, whatever that you put in the escrow. Yes, you can put in. Um, basically, have you heard of like a USDT, uh, like Tether? So no. you know, there's obviously like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and these prices go all over the place. What they did, um, this company called Tether. They made a coin that is always pegged to the U.S. dollar. So it is always exactly one-to-one, -one, and there are their own questions there. Can that peg remain? Maybe you remember the Terra Luna crash? That was a, yeah, another stable coin. stable coin. Yeah. Yes, that de-pegged. Um, but that's, that's someone else's business, right? It's their business to make sure it's stable. We just accept it. So you can take your USDT, the Tether stable coin, and then you can deposit or you can actually use Ethereum and Bitcoin too. And this is actually something that's unique to us. Uh, only our exchange is able to basically take escrow and collateral denominated in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And you can imagine that would be difficult because if you deposit Bitcoin, the balance you see you have to trade, your available to trade balance is changing every single, mil every single second. And that's hard. And so that was something that we spent the last few months figuring out. But now we're able to take Bitcoin, Ethereum and stable coins as collateral. Uh, and that's that's pretty valuable, especially to Bitcoin maxis, because a lot of people have Bitcoin. There's over a trillion dollars in Bitcoin just sitting out there doing nothing. The Bitcoin has absolutely no source of, of yield. Ethereum, um, Ethereum can be used to basically uh, secure that public blockchain, the Excel, uh, global Excel spreadsheet. You basically put your Ethereum there and you get paid every time you want someone to trade. So Ethereum actually has around a 3.5% yield. So you earn Ethereum. It's a productive asset. Um, as we know, U.S. dollars are a productive asset. They earn 5.5% in U.S. treasuries. Um, gold is not a productive asset. What's that? At the moment. At if the someone's moment. Listening uh, to this com if someone's listening to this in like oh. two years, I don't want to get them confused. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, in fact, actually, in, in um, seven days, it will no longer, it'll be 5%. In all hope, we were really looking for a rate cut. Um, so September 17th, future viewers will, will know if that happened or not. Um, but yes, so US dollars have yield, Ethereum has yield, a lot of assets have, have yield. Uh, most currencies uh, do as well. Bitcoin has no yield. And so what we're able to do for the first time, and this is f fairly unique to us, Users can actually take their Bitcoin, they can put it in, and they can use it as a trading balance. So they can basically trade using that as, as balance. Um, but what they can also do is they can stake it to our market maker. And there's a publicly um, auditable market maker uh, that uses predetermined algorithmic funds um, to basically be Citadel um, and have some liquidity and take the other side of the order. And you can deposit into this fund and share in the returns. And, you know, the famous crypto thing is where does the yield come from? Like it's all a freaking Ponzi scam. Most of crypto, unfortunately, is. Where does the yield come from? In this case, it comes from those trading fees. Uh, it comes from spreads uh, and it comes from basically interest. And if you put your Bitcoin in there, you can actually make Bitcoin a productive asset and then actually start getting paid in Bitcoin. Uh, and that's just about the first time that's happened. And that's very useful. So you can put your Bitcoin in and actually make Bitcoin a productive asset. Cool. Okay. And hasn't um, Binance had, wasn't there some scandal there as well? 
a uh, lot of scandals with with Binance. So anytime you rest, um, and we're actually backed by Binance as well. I should um, I should say that. So I'm not necessarily an unbiased source, but anytime you put uh, power in the hands of a centralized entity, it will go wrong whether it's Enron or FTX or Binance or any example, or power government. corrupts absolutely. Or government, yes. Um, this or is government. what I'm trying to explain to my friend who wants a technocracy to like, so we have peace. I'm like, this does not work. <laughs> Um, is, um, is, 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 are they French? Because that's what the Macron is trying to do with the new prime minister. Interesting. No, he's Australian. And he gets well, so angry at me. He's like, oh, so you don't want peace. You want suffering. It's like freedom <laughs> has to come first because yeah, power corrupt. Like who's going to be in charge? Like you just, you cannot have this. Yeah. The power, basically it's, and the incentives just don't work. And so, you know, democracy is the worst form of government we've ever tried, except for all the other ones we've tried. Um, but I, I, I am, I dare to imagine a better system partially secured by decentralized systems. Um, maybe not blockchain per se, but this idea of free speech, censorship resistance, and the ability to control and profit from your own assets. Those to me are the three ideals of blockchain and crypto everything else is noise and i think those are representative of what the world needs right now overall in government in in companies uh at large um financial institutions everyone needs that and i think eventually we will use the power of blockchain to i mean we've already seen that a little bit have you uh, heard of polymarket Poly market is um, a prediction market on the price of of or of of the probability of certain events. So you can go to poly market right now and look up what is the probability that Trump or Harris will win the election. And a good um, example of of how this so this is a blockchain application that has actually reached mainstream adoption. So it's one of those few blockchain ap applications that um, people like CNN are showing the poly market numbers on there. So that's a huge win for crypto. Um, but why is this significant? So when the controversy of like when Biden was going to drop out, you may remember that, uh, they were saying, oh, Biden is absolutely not going to drop out up until the minute before he actually dropped out of the race. They were saying no chance is going to happen. Poly market had priced in, uh, you can keep me honest here, but I, it was, I believe anywhere from like a 40 to 60% chance that this was going to happen. Um, and this level of transparency is only made possible by the blockchain because that tool for people to look at and and basically get a real check on what's happening in America and the world is only possible when you have something that cannot be censored because that's the whole point about blockchain because this has never existed before. You have a, a free-flowing capital structure where anyone can just invest and there's no government regulation on it. Um, there's no uh, way to shut it down. Uh, believe me, Biden would have loved for that to be shut down because that, at least on the right side of the aisle, because unfortunately we still only do pay attention to uh, things that fit our confirmation bias. But at least a lot of people were able to say, hey, this is not a far-flung um, chance. This is not a conspiracy theory, basically. It's almost like the conspiracy theory debunker because you can look up – because you, you may have also seen the people were saying, oh, J.D. Vance is such a bad pick that he's going to drop out and they're going to replace JD Vance. That on poly market was trading at like 6%, 6 to 7%. So that's kind of like, you know, conspiracy theory-esque. Uh, but then Biden was like 40 to 6%, he'll drop out. So you can kind of say, hmm, hey, you're saying that these people are saying that Biden's going to drop out as a conspiracy theory. Well, well, actually, no. Smart money says yes. And if you disagree, go bet and bring it back down to real odds. And uh, that's valuable. It's, it's like an open-sourced form of truth and i think you can take that and apply it in a bajillion other ways wow what so the markets are actually established by people trade by people betting money yes, against each other exactly. in like a decentralized way not through a bookkeeper or whatever exactly it's a decentralized censorship resistant bookie and you can go right now trade buy shares of kamala or buy shares of trump 
after the debate, they're both trading at around 49 cents. Uh, and so you can go right now, if, if you think Trump or Harris will win, go uh, and invest or trade rather. And uh, the, obviously the spreads will change based on where the market's moving. Cool. Oh my God. So interesting. Okay. Yeah. We have to wrap up, but okay. So the idea, so dropping out of Yale was just like, these things come a, along and it's going mm. somewhere and I wasn't loving Yale anyway. Yes. Well, that part's not true. I was loving Yale and actually I stayed in New Haven living amongst all my friends at Yale for the additional two years. So I never really dropped out. Also, I actually, yeah, I'll say this. Um, I actually never dropped out. I'm technically on an extended gap year, but the thing you have to say is you've dropped out. Um, but uh, that's what my mom would allow me to do. Um, so Wait, why do you have uh, to say them? Oh, like for oh, your brand. For, for my brand. <laughs> wow. So you might go back and get the degree. That's unlikely. Um, unless, unless everything falls apart, then maybe I'll have to. But if everything goes well, then that won't happen. Interesting. Okay. You don't uh, so want yeah, the so degree that... just to have a degree. Graduation yeah, ceremony. It's nice. Yeah. I mean, I went to the graduation ceremony for my friends, so I, I feel like I got... I'm 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 missing a, a cap and gown. That's that's about it, and a piece of paper. Um, but yeah, so no, I I did I did love uh, I love Yale, uh, love the the people there. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't a part of it. It was just there is something big here, and what I didn't like was the classes. That I will say I did not, did not enjoy dragging myself to classes, and that wasn't fun. So. I didn't want to continue doing that and doing stuff I didn't like. I'd rather go learn in the real world, make the world my classroom. And I got to experience everything else about Yale. I got to still go to the parties and, and have the friends and talk with professors and do clubs. I was still in Yale dance up until, you know, my senior year. So I basically arbitraged it is, is how I'd look at it. Cool. Okay. And how long ago was that? And that it was, was only the, like two years ago. Not even. It was um it was exactly two years ago. Wait, it's September it's September eleventh. Um it was September thirteenth, uh twenty twenty two, I think. So yeah, basically two years on the dot. That you joined the company. Or that you dropped that uh, that I I dropped out. Took yeah. extended leave. Got it. Yes. Cool. And when, and you moved to Barcelona in June. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, this is like a watch this space situation. Yes. Yes. Uh, to anyone listening, um, hopefully in a few months, crypto will be flying and there will be a lot of people telling their friends to go buy this latest coin and all this stuff. Don't just, just just be very careful um, investing in things that um, that are, are scams because a lot of the stuff in crypto is a scam. So basically, to be very careful is, is what I'm is what I'm saying to anyone anyone listening. Wait, I was going to ask what I should buy. I've been thinking like of buying crypto at some point, but and based on this conversation, I was thinking Ethereum for the three point. Mm. 5% or whatever you said. But then it's like, I can yeah. get that at the moment. I can get 4.9% or whatever from the bank at the moment. So maybe when that's no longer available. Yes. Um, I do, I do recommend um, getting some exposure to crypto. Um, in fact, I, I have most of my net worth in, in crypto, but in what I would say is the, the good part of crypto, which is Ethereum and Bitcoin. That's the only two assets I hold. And I guess technically my own company will have a token at some point. There is a lot of value in Bitcoin and Ethereum and and Solana as well. And there's a few other valuable companies out there. Dogecoin you know, or whatever it's called. Dogecoin. Yeah, I, I personally wouldn't recommend that one. Um, I don't see a long-term future there. But... Um, I, I the way I, I look at it is if maybe you have um 
a few a few bucks that you can say, hey, I'm gonna I'm, I'm comfortable if this goes to zero. If any amount of money you're comfortable doing that, then then that's okay. Um, put it into into Ethereum or Bitcoin. And uh, not only can you get that yield uh, with Ethereum and then soon with my product, um, with Bitcoin even, it's also likely, you know, to appreciate in, in value. So not only you'll get three and a half percent, but three and a half percent is going to be peanuts if it um, if it goes the way we hope it will um, and increase a lot in value. So if if it's a small amount of money, it has a chance to. To increase a lot, and I, I think I think I would classify Ethereum and Bitcoin as investments. I would not classify a lot of the other crypto, uh, though I would say that's speculation or trading. Uh, and then another thing, very briefly, you said um, you can get like 4.9 percent from the bank. Another thing you can do, forget crypto exposure, you can get the stablecoin USDT, and you can actually get the bank rate. So when you go to the bank they're going to you know take a spread but what tether does tether has a very big account and invested and it gives up that yield um and basically negotiates on your behalf so if you have tether and then you basically get the bank rate you can get a higher rate from the us dollar or from maybe the australian dollar as well um rather than getting 4.9 percent from the bank basically you're cutting out the commission by using crypto because there's no bookie it's it's decentralized uh, and so you're able to get that a little bit higher and so another thing to, to look at cool okay okay last three questions all right how do you stay grounded mm, i stay grounded um i like being very open and honest with my team like just yesterday we, I had a conversation where it's like, tell me what I'm doing wrong and, and let me know how we can do it better. And so I, I'll just, I'll just, I, I, yeah, I, I just think being very honest and, and just sort of, that's a good way to, to not get carried away. Um, so that, that'd be one way. I also really like, um, just get going for, for walks, putting the phone away, um, do not disturb or even off is better. And, and yeah, it's going on, on, on long, especially when I have big decisions to make, I'll go on like very long walks and then just, uh, let my subconscious, which is a more powerful engine than our, our conscious mind, uh, do some thinking. Love that answer. Okay. Is there a book that's had a big influence on your life? I am actually not a great reader. Um, I will recommend a maybe a podcast or youtube video instead or do you prefer the book yeah yeah yeah. go for it yes um oh now i have to actually pick um one that's coming to mind is the egg by andy weir uh it's a actually it is originally a book i just do you know i just read that oh the thing about how the universe works yeah yeah i i love that yeah but i have a major issue with the last line oh, because tell me. or the second last line okay because the idea right is like everyone is you like you're just mm-hmm. past lives whatever like your consciousness is like recycled and there's no time time is like a human concept so it's like you are someone 5,000 years ago and in the future and whatever. It's like all happening because time doesn't exist. But then at the end, and then so he's like talking to God or whatever. And it's like, oh, so when do I become you? And then he applies the framework of time to that. It's like, oh, you have to be reborn again. And he puts the idea of the future onto it but it's like no but there is no future there is no time everything's cycling through simultaneously so therefore there's no point to reach i don't think at least the way i interpreted it the point wasn't to abstract time it was just to abstract our place and time so i think there's still a start middle and end but 
it's you can go like forwards and backwards. So you can be the Chinese peasant in the year 5000, then you can go be a Roman soldier, and then you can go be, you know, um, Mansa Musa in West Africa. But you can jump around between those, and then, but at the end, you know, at some point humanity will end. And that point, once you've experienced every human, then I guess that's the future point. That's my impression, at least. But how does? But it's already all happening at once. Like everyone that ever exists yeah. is already being experienced in this moment. Maybe, uh, maybe it's like a thread, right? Like, so time is a cloth, and you are, you know, sewing in and out. You go backwards and forwards. At one point you're there, then another point you're here, but you do start over here, and then you do end here, and then in between it's just a mess. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But, but I, I, I do I, like... Yeah, go ahead. I do like thinking of that. Or I more think of, like, I'm in a simulation and, like, people are NPCs. Or mm. Like, if I have an embarrassing thing happen, or, you know, like, <laughs> I'm rejected or something, and it's like, oh, that person doesn't even exist. <laughs> like, they were yes. just there to, like, teach me this lesson. <laughs> and now... Do they even exist? Who knows? <laughs> yes. Uh, I I think like that sometimes too. I I really like, yeah, anything like, I, the first reason, like it, the, it popped into my head because it's like philosophical and I like anything philosophical that makes you think about thinking. The other reason I really like it is because sometimes as people, we need to do bad things. And we need to do bad things to other people. And thinking about imagining that person as if it was me really grounds myself to think it's like, for example, so like just today, we have a, a client that uh, we are basically not able to service their uh, product. So we need to like cancel the contract, uh, send the money back and take the hit on all the money we already invested. And that is uh, not good. Uh, or I need to, like, say, fire someone. Um, that's maybe, a, maybe a, a more pointed example. And I have to – it forced me to think of everything objectively. It's like, so this – imagine this is myself. Um, is this still the right decision to make? Am I being, like, unnecessarily cruel here? And that's, that's a really good um, way to think about it because it's the same vein of thought of – you ever heard of the thought experiment where it's like – design a world with different people and different classes and different things. So you can design one person that has everything and then 99% of people are poor, but you don't know which person you'll be. That forces you to design the most fair world because you don't know yeah, where you'll be. The veil of ignorance. Yes. Yes. So I think... I can't remember what his name is. Yeah. Yeah. But that is... idea. Okay. That's also like Jesus's main message. Is it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. But no, but I think the the difference here is hate is justified because I think you can do bad things and and I guess hate uh, or at least not love if it's justified. So basically, it's like okay, well, this employee did something wrong and I need to fire them and you know I dislike them or whatever. Um, but if that was me, I deserve it. <laughs> like, that's what you have to think about. Like, if I was at one point Hitler, Hitler deserves to be killed. And if that was me, then hate is justified there. But you can do it in a loving way. You can always do things in a loving way with compassion. It's like with a child being naughty, like you love the child, but it's like very clear, do not do this. So it's like firing an employee. It's like can be open hearted love and compassion, but it's like this, even mm. just like you're not need, you know, this is where part of like this bigger mission to do this, like your role is no longer needed or like you're violated this contract. This is what it is, but it can always be open hearted. And yeah. that's like the ultimate goal for, I'm just writing about this because I just did a Vipassana. Mm. I'm writing it something about it and Gawanka, the guy that teaches it had this cool had some teaching about jesus it's talking about how open-hearted he was at the time of death like he just had full compassion 
for the people who were killing him, who were crucifying him. Because it's just like, oh, they're, they're just ignorant. They don't know what they're doing. And that's like the goal of enlightenment or whatever to at all times. Which doesn't mean you're like pushed around, not at all. And if you think of people like really kind, loving lead like Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, they're not like pushovers. They're like very firm, but it's always from a place of love. Maybe that is a good goal, but I'll be honest and I haven't reached that. Um I, I'm definitely not I use I it more as anyone, a... I don't think anyone has. <laughs> I mean, otherwise you'd be like fully Buddha status. I wouldn't even say it's a goal, though. I wouldn't say my goal is to be loving at every situation. I think I want to be fair. I want justice. That's that's the goal for me. Nice. Yeah, truth. It's like can all be interchanged. Love, truth, purity, light, whatever. Some of those words are a bit cringe, and, but that's just language labels. They can't point to, like, what it is. I found it very um, fine. I know we're wrapping up here, but one last anecdote. I saw you tweet about the retreat you went on where you weren't able to harm animals and the whole Australian outback. It's funny, you can't smash a, a spider, but um, I, I thought that was... Uh, sort of in the vein of the the loving thing and also cool i've never done something like that i i always wonder how that is i'll send you what i write about it if i ever finish writing it please because it's like a lot to put into words um okay wait last question what three words describe the best version of jose oh mm. um Let's see. I would say intelligent, fair, and curious. Amazing. And where can people find you? If you want to be found, uh, which presumably you do. Yes. Uh, Jose uh, Bet and Court on Twitter. So, uh, yeah, Jose Bet and Court on Twitter. And that's that's just about where um, you can find the company tags from all that. And that's where I spend most of my social media time. Amazing. Or in Barcelona. Where's your... And it's around. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. Where's your surname from, by the way? Is that Colombia? Um, it's funny. It's in. Um, it's very popular in Colombia and Venezuela, but it's like French by origin. I don't know why. It's one of the. I did like a project in middle school or something where you look up your last name and yeah, it's French in origin, but it's very common in in Latin American countries. How do they pronounce it there? Probably uh, Betancourt. And it has a lot of different spellings, too. Sometimes two Ts, sometimes an E instead of an A. But for me, it's um, the best way, I think. Great. All right. Cool. Thanks for chatting. Thank you, Delia. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to this conversation. Feel free to share it with someone if you think that would get something out of it. And... um. You can also subscribe or follow the podcast so then you find out about new episodes and purely for my own ego. No, just kidding. I think it actually helps the algorithm and helps um, more people find the podcast. If you want to rate or review, like, go for it. And see you next time.